diplomas. He did a fellowship. His fellowship trained at orthopedic uh, hospital at Slow, uh, Sloan Kettering Center uh, in New York. And I think I'll let Dr. Rosenthal take it from here. All right. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be speaking to everybody tonight. And uh, just remember to stay safe uh, and healthy. We all know uh, our graft options. They're varied and widely um, variable in where they come from and how they react. And we have well over 50 years experience now with various types of, whether it's autogenous graft, um, allographic uh, bone, or various different biologics or substitutes. However, again, as we all know, there are, there are limitations and problems related to each one. For example, with autograph, painful and difficult to obtain enough volume, complications, extending the length of time of surgery, higher complication rate. With allograft, whatever type it is, whether it's a DBM, cancellous graft, high rate of non-incorporation, high rate if you go in a second time and, it's, and sample the area, you can see a lot of fibrotic non-ossified bone, and then the various calcium sulfates, uh, calcium phosphates, uh, which sometimes you can go back in and you find a slurry of what looks like toothpaste in all honesty. Other problems, especially in the tumor field where I concentrate myself is things like the use of coral, which does not biodegrade and is there forever. Um, can we see signs of tumor recurrence in that situation? Hopefully we're not gonna have tumor recurrence, but the reality is, is that's why we're following our patients. So the problem specifically in the tumor world um, is replacement of large segments of bone, okay, or large cavities of bone, not just a fracture, but you know, the entire diameter of the bone. By the way, before I continue, it, can you see the slides? Am yes. I, you're seeing what I'm, looking, I'm showing. Okay, great. Okay, so we're trying to deal with replacement of these large segments of bone we're trying to do this in a variety of age ranges and without the bone trying to do some, without the um, transplanted bone trying to do something to the host bone, but also looking at the environment of that recipient site. Remember that recipient site is a tumor field. A tumor field is a um, fairly hostile environment. Changes in the pH, changes in the environment of the bone itself stresses across the bone are a bit different. Uh, growth plate issues in the younger patients, for example, very extensive areas of replacement to the shaft of bone. So the way I look at it is if we can get bone to heal in the hostile environment of a tumor, then how much more so will it heal in a subchondral cyst or a fracture or trauma situation? So some of the challenges also of these tumor defects is a lot of these benign tumors, we require um, additional adjuvants or margin enhancers, argon laser, phenol. I do a lot of cryosurgery, freezing of the bone. Well, that freezing of the bone enhances the margin of, of tumor kill and therefore bony kill up to 15 millimeters. Now I'm trying to fill a defect that has tumor in it, but also trying to get it to heal with dead bone present throughout the periphery. Obviously the location and size results in a significant structural compromise. The tumor deforms the bone, so we have to concentrate on the ability of that bone to remodel itself once we have eradication of the tumor. And then some benign tumors we would prefer to treat with a limited exposure or mini exposure. Can we place the bone graft substitute into the bone through these limited exposures? Resorption and incorporation depends on the local factors, that being the local blood supply. What happens if I want to arteriographically embolize the tumor prior to extraction? Or just the alteration, for example, as I mentioned with cryosurgery, is certainly going to um, change that local blood supply. The size of the cavity, we can't create an entire new skeleton. You know, the, the typical fracture model or deep bony defect model is we're measuring in millimeters. I'm talking about cubits. I'm talking about large areas. The bone host health of that cavity, again, chemicals, freezing, radiation, metaphyseal and diaphyseal location is gonna remodel in different fashions. And then of course, as I mentioned, the age range of the patient and the host themselves. Are they smokers? Uh, do they have other metabolic bone diseases and so forth? 
Let's look at some case examples. This is a uh, calcaneal unicameral bone cyst. You can see it on the Harris view right here. This is a non-ossifying fibroma treated with nanobone. Uh, this is one week post-op, three months post-op. What you're seeing around the periphery is that remodeling, that reincorporation of normal bone into the defect. We can see it's slightly denser, so we can see exactly where it was. A nice line of incorporation of that bone, and as time goes on, you actually see remodeling of that bone. Unicameral bone cysts of the proximal femur, very large defect in a stress-enhanced location. Okay, that's certainly at risk for fracture. Uh, so one thing I need to worry about is, is the use of nanobone going to impact or impinge on my ability to perform prophylactic internal fixation? Am I going to get the remodeling capability of that bone through the bone graft substitute? This is the way I will do this intralesional curatage to a small hole in the piriformis fossa so I'm not weakening the bone any further. If I place the hole or the window of the bone right here, I'd certainly be able to get a little bit better view of that tumor. But you know, imagine a hole in the bone here, a large defect here. That bone is destined to fracture. Uh, I'd rather not do that. So I use various size angled curettes, reverse curettes, 90 degree curettes, 45 degree curettes, pituitary rongeurs, until I can be sure that I get that entire lesion and the lining out. And then through that hole, I can also inject the nanobone, which is all right here. You can see a fluffiness to it. And then I'll do my prophylactic and dental fixation through that same hole. This is a carbon fiber nail, so I know you can't see it. Um, but that allows me to follow that tumor and that remodeling, searching both for, again, local recurrence, but also for bony healing and, most importantly, bony remodeling. The nice thing about that is once we get that bony remodeling, we know that it's the host bone itself replacing the biodegradable um, nanobone. And after that point, we essentially have completely normal bones. So we also now have not burned any bridges for anything else that might be necessary for this bone, for this patient. Should this patient in later years need a hip replacement, you can have a hip replacement just like anybody else, labral tears, et cetera. Everything is exactly the way uh, it would be for any other patient that did not have a bone graft. Let's look at the nanobiology. Nanobone consists of nanocrystals of the hydroxyapatite dispersed in this amorphous silica gel matrix, the ASG. It's this silica gel, actually, that may be the most important component. Uh, the HA nanocrystals have a similar size, chemistry, and morphology to normal HA in bone, which is essential for bony healing, remodeling, and incorporation. They're not bound to one another, and the autologous proteins can absorb rapidly to the surface. That large surface area, um, as Steve mentioned, can be the size of a tennis court huge amount of surface areas. When we're dealing with bony healing, as we all know, the more surface area to allow for contact of the bone graft or bony healing to occur, the larger the percentage of bony healing that will, will occur. That silica matrix that holds the HA nanocrystals in place is porous with an extremely large internal surface area that attracts those autologous proteins also due to the uh, silica in it. Um, and it's hydrophilic, releasing the silicon, silicon dioxide, which triggers new angiogenesis and new bone formation. So we're not left with this putty of calcium sulfate, for example, that has no regenerative processes, no osteoinductive processes. We're actually getting new chemicals, new BMPs, and new nutrition to the actual area of bone grafting through this uh, silica gel and the angiogenesis and new bone formation. Here's an interesting example of an osteoid osteoma in the anterior, dis anterior distal femur. Very small lesion, hard to see on a plain film, but there it is, hard to find. But once we find it, um, I'd like to bone graft it. And the reality is, is uh, here's the bone grafted area. It looks like um, it's incorporated completely. The hole that I created to extract this is larger than the original tumor, meaning that I did get it all out completely with good clear margins. Think about this if I used a, a uh, cement um, or some coral type of product that would not remodel or resorb or is not biodegradable, this young patient, because osteoarthromas occur in the younger age range, has this piece of inorganic material in a subchondral location for the rest of their lives. 
Think about it in terms of burning bridges, as I mentioned. Um, can you do a regular total hip, total knee replacement? Sure, you could, but you got to add some bone graft when you take that cement out. So this gives a biological response to this. Next question is, is boy, for a small lesion like that, can I do this more through a mini approach or a, um, a, a very small incision uh, directing that bone graft exactly where we are? And I'll talk about that in a little bit. The lateral, again, you can see the area of where that bone graft is. It's slightly more dense, but um, it looks like bone. As time goes on, you can actually see revascularization. This isn't the live picture. This is on a slideshow, obviously. So I can't zoom in on it. But if I was to, were to zoom in on this, you would actually see retrobecularization of the bone, indicating that remodeling of the host bone replacing the nanobone. Here is a giant cell tumor of the proximal phalanx. Big hole in the bone is already a fracture through it. And if there weren't, this is still an impending fracture. Giant cell tumors of bone are considered aggressive, uh, although benign, although actually they can metastasize and obviously need to be treated. Best treatment being surgical excision, that surgery being curatage and graft. With curatage and graft, uh, the local recurrence rate approaches 50% which is typically unacceptable. So a common method of treating giant cell tumor bone is cure it out and then pack it with cement. The exothermic reaction of the cement uh, creates a heat that is hot enough to give a marginal kill. In other words, kill the, the uh, margins of that cavity up to about two, three millimeters. Um, so now we've got, that's one millimeter. So now we've got two, three millimeters of kill. In other words, dead bone from here to here trying to get that dead bone to heal to an inorganic prog uh, uh, product. If I were to use cryosurgery, which is what I would use, that's even more so because cryosurgery give a further marginal kill. So we've got to use something that will quickly allow bone to heal through that. And again, remodeling, which is so important. Here's the lateral. You can see again, it's 95% the diameter of the bone after filling with the nanobone, AP and lateral, and then ultimately you get the remodeling of the bone uh, and healing. Uh, this is a clinically proven cost-effective replacement for other bone grafting materials having been in the market for several years. We talked about many approaches. How can I get that nanobone into a, through a small incision into a small area? And I use the QD, the quick delivery device, which is essentially a a fat syringe with a plunger to extend the usability of the nanobone. Um, one can use this uh, applicator and you put it in exactly as, as you need to. And these can come in um, five centimeters or five cubic centimeters or 10 cc syringes uh, or multiple syringes to give you 10 cc's. Uh, so you can get the same amount through this as well as through the, uh, the putty. The putty technique is a, a larger syringe which you can take out and mix on the back table and put it in by hand or inject it directly uh, using this uh, syringe into larger areas. So here's another example of a smaller nodule in the femoral neck. I really don't want to be making a window in here because a window in the femoral neck with the addition of this bone tumor is certainly going to create problems in terms of stress risers and fractures. So this is something that percutaneously, I can put a guide wire through that directly into it under two views using a C-arm and then put the uh, quick delivery uh, syringe directly over that and inject after extracting the tumor. There have been uh, various peer-reviewed articles looking at the nanostructuring of these biomaterials or a pathway to bone growth substitutes. And what they show is the deposition of these molecules supports the early phase nanobone degradation by osteoclasts promoting the production of new bone tissue, essentially the de definition of remodeling a bone. You get incorporation of those um, immunohistochem immunohistochemical proteins that are required for bone healing, osteopontin, osteocalcin, BMP, all in there attracted by that silicon gel with alkaline phosphatase activity indicating, um, act indicating living tissue and active growth of that tissue. So here's that uh, example after filling with the um, nanobone. And as time goes on, that will continue 
to uh, incorporate and remodel uh, back to normal. You can already see the reactive bony margin indicating uh, bony growth. These, I don't know if you could see it uh, on the Zoom, but a couple of little things. These are my test uh, wires where I'm going until I finally get into the right uh, location. Here is a large tumor in the distal femur, an atypical like enchondroma or low-grade chondrosarcoma. So we've got endosteal abutment over here, obviously loss of bone over about a seven centimeter distance. This is going to be need, need to be taken out. One can fill it with cement, but again, cement, an inorganic process that will burn bridges for the future, especially in younger patients. I'd rather use a bone graft substitute. I know, for example, that I will not have to radiate this lesion postoperatively, so I'm going to use a bone graft. Sorry. And that bone graft we put in here, I do prophylactically fixate it because I do have to make a hole to get into it. And one can barely even assess where that lesion was. No longer a hole. This is filled with bone that incorporates and encourages the local bone to grow into it, replace it, and again, revascularization um, as the months go on. Same thing over here. I can barely get a sense that here is the defect from here to about here, uh, but that looks like normal bone. All right, non-bone tumor standpoints, I have avascular necrosis. We can't make dead bone living again. Certainly by taking that dead bone out and putting nanobone or any other product, whether it's a bone graft or a bone substitute or an inorganic substance, is not going to make that better. Um, but by doing essentially a large core decompression. I'm going to curette that out. I've got a big empty space. I'm going to curette out that to, to the normal bone, and I'm going to replace it with the nanobone. This is three months afterwards, and boy, doesn't that start looking like normal bone again. If it doesn't incorporate completely, okay, if we cannot transform this, this lesion into a living bone area, aren't we at least giving now a good foundation for the total knee replacement? which would have been the answer preoperatively before I did this, but a total knee replacement needs a foundation of bone. You would have had to do a proximal tibia replacement, which burns bridges. This way, maybe, maybe I'm going to get relief of pain, maybe I'm gonna get structural stability, but certainly I'm going to give a better foundation for receipt of that knee replacement should that knee replacement be necessary. And the lateral, the same thing, you can see the area of remodeling a bone down here. This is the host bone incorporating into the incorporating into and filling that nano bone replacement. Now this is about 20 to 30 cc's. Our average I think is 24 cc's by the way. Um, so it's going to take several packages. Um, encouraging um, Steve to make a 20 cc uh, syringe also because uh, that's uh, again we we very commonly will need that amount. Um, we've performed over 130 nanobone cases over the last three years with the average volume of about 16 cc's. Sometimes I'll mix putty and gels together. Um, initiation of weight bearing, I'll do it six weeks and 12 weeks for full weight bearing. We've had no associated infections with the graft and what really isn't considered rejection, but what I'm talking about is where you get dissolution of the graft. Um, all four were secondary to tumor recurrence, not because the graft um, rejected or, or resorbed away. Um, as I said, there's a significant amount of surface area in the one gram of nanobone, as much as a surface area of a tennis court, and that very large internal surface area strongly attracts and binds the autologous, autologous osteopontin, the osteocalcin, and BM2 that are critical for new bone formation and remodeling, uh, the silica gel again, behaves as an attractor for these substances as well. And that internal surface area, the term is the resorption rate of the bone grafts. And in clinical cases across um, all scenarios, so I'm not talking about just tumors, but I'm also talking about um, trauma situations and so forth, um, completely converted to autologous bone in as little as one year. So in summary, the special structure of nanobone results in an extremely quick bone formation and bony remodeling back to normal host bone, thereby not causing any type of um, problems related to uh, burning of bridges for other procedures that can be carried out. 
Uh, the clinical studies show that a stable implant bed is available in the case, for example, in the mandible for the sinus, the maxilla for the sinus floor elevation. Uh, even for implants, dentists are using it for implants rather than, rather than having to wait uh, as long as necessary. Um, and this is how the use of the nanobone can considerably re reduce those treatment time periods as well. You get three months, you get 37% of it is bone, new bone formation, 43% of the bone marrow, bone marrow space. Um, and look at the resorption of that bone, of the nanobone as time goes on, that resorption rate is replacement with normal host bone. So in this context, the angiogenic osteogenesis of nanobone constitutes a real difference in the quality of that new bone formation, the ability to fill in that bone void uh, with new host remodel remodelability bone. We get the bone filling and incorporation, bone remodeling, and recognition of that bone better as itself. <laughs> Any questions? Thanks. I guess we'll open it up to questions. We do have a couple of questions uh, from an attendee, and it says, uh, because of faster remodeling with nanobone, do you find you are getting patients weight-bearing sooner, especially in younger patients? So for me, that's a very good question. I think the answer, in all honesty, is yes, because it's such an active process that goes on fairly quickly. Um, allowing them to wait there a little earlier does allow and induce that remodeling to occur. But in all honesty, on the other hand, when I'm dealing with a 24 cubic centimeter defect, um, very commonly I am going to prophylactically internal fixate it. So I may be relying on that to allow the patient to wait there. I do, I, I, when I see the patient back with x-rays, it's a six weeks and 12 weeks, and you can absolutely see the retrabecularization of the bone, um, indicating that I could proceed with weight-bearing status uh, somewhere between the six and 12 week period of time. 